Do what? I'm still not hearing any of it. I will have to film it while you're leaving the singing. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. I also forgot to, uh, you know, we did all that to charge it up. I was supposed to delete my um, a sermon or two to make room. So we got about 17 minutes, 39 seconds for this to, uh, for me to preach this sermon. If we want to get all of it on uh, recorded. But we're not going to let that hinder us. We're going to preach. Turn to the book of Romans. We're going to preach uh, as long as we need to to uh, get you all straightened out. Anna, we might be here all night. <laughs> to what? <laughs> all right. Romans chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For that which that I would, or for what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. And then there is no more I that do it, but the sin, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform it, or how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good which that I would do, I do not. And the evil that I would not do, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inner, inward man. And I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God but with the flesh, the law of sin. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you've allowed us. We thank you for the blessings we've already seen tonight, Lord. And we just ask that you would continue on with us, that you would help us, that you would guide us, that you would direct us, and that you would enable me to preach. Forgive me my sins that I might perform this task. We just ask that you would speak to us, direct us, give us comfort, give us rebuke, give us whatever we need. We ask that you would save any that are lost. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name for his glory. Amen. Amen. I'd like to preach tonight why we still struggle. Why we still struggle. Now, there are certain um, passages that I remember reading for the first time, and this is one of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember hearing this on a cassette tape that had the gospel on it, that had the, the Bible on it, and uh, uh, listening to that, and it was the most confusing thing I'd ever heard in my life. As a matter of fact, just reading it is, is difficult. Um, and trying to understand what he's saying, it almost sounds like double talk and, and, uh, as we look at this, but um, Paul is talking about his struggles as a Christian with sin. His struggles with Christian as, as a Christian with sin, and we all have that struggle. Uh, I have a friend who denies that he sins anymore because he's saved, um, and I cannot convince him otherwise. It doesn't matter how many scriptures I point out uh, to him, but it, it, in any event, the Bible is clear that that. Paul was still struggling with sin. 
We still struggle with sin whether we admit it or not. As a matter of fact, if you don't feel like you're struggling with sin, you might have a problem. You might have a problem because sin is not bothering you. The sin that is in your life is not bothering you. Uh, it, it bothers us that we sin as Christians. We're not happy with it. And, and that's the big, and I may be jumping to the end here in my introduction, uh, but uh, that's okay too. Uh, one of the big evidences that we are saved is that our sins bother us. And a saved person can get to the point where they sin and they justify it and they rationalize it to the point where they no longer call it sin and that's an issue. That's a big issue. So if your sin is bothering you, amen, that's a good thing. That means that you are uh, uh, um, being affected by something that is toxic in your life. Uh, if you get around something that, that is toxic and you're breathing those fumes, it, it bothers you. you. You choke it out. When it no longer bothers you, that's an issue. Why is a, um, oh, I can't think of what, it, what it's called. Uh, what you would get from your car, that, that gas that, that comes in. Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. Boy, why is that so dangerous? Because you don't smell it, you don't feel it, you might get, and then before you know it, you're gone. It is good that sin bothers us uh, because it gives us a desire to take care of that sin. Now, Paul, here in, the, in this, this passage, shares the facts with us in verse 14. And by the, by the way, uh, uh, probably the, the, the best, before we get into that, the, the, the best... Uh, uh, verse out of here to demonstrate the point that Paul is making is verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I meant to reread that before we went on. Uh, Paul is uh, perplexed and he is uh, distressed that there is still... Now this is the Apostle Paul. There are still things in his life, whether he's actually committing the sin uh, physically, uh, whether he's uh, just committing it in his mind like that's... a. Uh, not a, a problem. It is a problem. Um, we all have sin in our life. We, it, it may be the, the things that we say. It may be our attitudes. It may be uh, uh, something else, but it's all sin and, and it should bother us, bother us. Paul shares the facts in verse 14. He says, the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Number one, let's look at that first statement. The law is spiritual. Now we tend to think uh, especially those of us who uh, uh, understand the grace of God do, to some extent. We, we tend to think that the law is not spiritual uh, because we think, oh, well, that's legalism and people are trying to be saved by the fact that they do not sin, that they don't commit sin or, or uh, there's some sin that keeps them from being saved. And they get legalistic about it, they think that, that that they're being like Pharisees when they say that the law is spiritual. Um, we believe that the law, many times in our thinking, is the enemy or the antithesis of grace. That the law and grace are in enemies. And Paul never states that in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, the law and grace go together. The law is spiritual. Because it is given to us by who? God. God made the law. So how we, if we could not say that the law, or make a statement that the law is not spiritual, when God himself, who is a spirit, gave us the law. It was given by him. It was given by God. It was given for our good. The reason why the law exists is for our good. It is the warning signs that God gives us. It is the instructions that, that gives us to keep us safe, to keep us happy, to keep us from, from um, things that would destroy our lives. You know, we talk so much about sin uh, being uh, um, an affront to God, which it is, but it is a danger to us as well. 
It was given by God, therefore it is spiritual. It is given for our good that we might benefit. The law was given to, as Paul and elsewhere says, that it was given as our schoolmaster to teach us right from wrong. And even apart from the law that God gave, you know, uh, uh, Brother Raymond was talking about Moses here just a, a, a little bit. Uh, not just the law that God gave Moses and the written down law that we have, but we have a natural law that God gives us. Even the heathen, even, even in countries where uh, they do not know God, even here in America where people do not know God, they know right from wrong. God has given us a natural sense of the law, and he has also given us a written sense. The law is spiritual, but the flesh is sinful. The flesh is sens uh, sensual. It is carnality. He says there in that verse, the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. It is sensual and it is sinful in the fact that it seeks pleasure. It's not seeking good. It's not necessarily seeking what's good for us. And, 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 and oftentimes, oftentimes it is not good for us. We had Kyrie last night and she got up this morning. Sister Pi asked her what she wanted for breakfast. You know what she wanted? A piece of cake. She kept saying she wanted a piece of cake. She wanted a piece of cake. You want sausage? No. You want eggs? No. I, I want a piece of cake. She kept saying she wanted a piece of cake. Now that wouldn't be good for her, would it? But we sometimes are, are, are just the same way. We want what perhaps tastes good. We want what, what's temporarily pleasing. And as you can tell, I have eaten my share of cake in my day. But it is also carnal. And carnality is death. So it seeks pleasure. It, it seeks it gratification. Uh, many times seeks, and most of the time, seeks instant gratification. But it serves itself. It seeks pleasure, but it serves itself. The flesh serves itself. It, it, it is one of the reasons why we're so selfish. We seek our own pleasure. We seek our own leisure sometimes. You know, some, sin can be just not doing anything. I want to tell you, and I've already said it, but what a blessing it was tonight that, that Audrey came forward and played for us as we sang. Amen. You know, the easy thing to do is sit there and do nothing. But she came up there and she played and brought, um, added to the service, added to the worship of our Lord. When we're selfish, it serves, we, we, we're serving ourselves. We're serving our flesh. But it satisfies, and I think I've already alluded to this, it satisfies temporarily. Whenever we, we, we seek to please ourselves, to please our flesh in, in whatever form that we do, and it can be something like a, a gossip. You know, when we think of sensuality and we think of lust and we think of sin, uh, we, we think of uh, some kind of sexual immorality a lot of times, but it can be gossip. It can be a, a, an improper attitude toward those that have authority or leadership over us. It could be many, many things. And it satisfies us. Temporarily. Often we anticipate the sin and, and uh, it tantalizes us. We perhaps enjoy it while we're doing it. But then that sensation is fleeting. We feel guilty afterwards. And once again, that's a good thing. 
I know people that can do anything and never feel guilty about it. They, they, they never feel guilty about things that, that we, we know are wrong. So when, I, when I'm making these statements, I'm talking about saved people. People that have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. It, it, it is fleeting. It is unfulfilling. Generally what happens when you succumb to that sin and you don't repent of that sin you getting full of the Holy Spirit down there sister um, it's like the Mississippi squirrel revival uh, but it's unfulfilling what happens we, we, we want more and it can end up uh, in studying for this, I was listening to a, a guy who was asking a, the question about this very topic, and he was talking about how he was a drug addict. And for like five years after he was saved, he did not desire drugs. But recently, he started feeling that desire again. He said, and even on a couple of occasions, I succumb to those feelings. And what happened, he felt distraught and it burdened him and that's why he was posing this question but what happens when you get into to a sin is it will drag us further and further David committed the sin of adultery then that sin went on to lying and that sin eventually went to murder Now you're saying, well, that will never happen to me. You'd be surprised where your sin will take you. Especially as a child of God. Even as a child of God, it is fleeting, it is unfulfilling, and it is fatal because Paul said, I am carnal. All these things lead to something. Sin is never beneficial. It's not beneficial for the lost person. It's not beneficial for the child of God. We always pay for it. 